The following is a hoop ball presentation. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. This will be the off-season long remembered as the one where the Moby and Toby show came to its conclusion, and we all shed a tear, especially the man you'll be hearing from momentarily here. I'm Dan Baspris. He is Brandon Marcus, lifelong Clippers fan and man in love with Boban Marjanovic. This is, uh, this is a weird day for you. John Wick changed him. He's a changed man. <laughs> He couldn't handle it anymore. He had to leave Los Angeles. He had to leave Philadelphia. And now he's just got to go and enjoy Whataburger in Dallas. <laughs> Boban, two years, $7 million deal with the Dallas Mavericks. Um, the silliness aside, Dallas is loading up on big men right now. They extended Porzingis by $150 million. They gave uh, Dwight Powell an extra three years on his deal. They signed Maxi Kleba. Um, that, I mean, how much does Boban actually play with this Dallas team? We saw that they were willing to use Salamagery in that sort of like big lumbering ox role. So I've got to figure Boban's basically just going to fill that, right? Yeah, you'd assume. And if Dwight Powell goes down or if Porzingis were to go down, then maybe you'd see him get some more time. You're assuming Porzingis is going to play the four. Um, we'll see exactly what Carlisle decides to do. Uh, but yeah, I mean, he'll take some of the minutes with Dwight Powell. He'll probably pet play 10 to 15 unless somebody gets hurt and then you can go ahead and fire him up in, uh, in daily contest. But if it's an extended period of time, I mean, we've seen him really be inconsistent. I mean, last year there were moments of just absolute delight when he would play 15 minutes and get 10 points, 10 rebounds and three blocks. And then all of a sudden he would just bust with two points and three rebounds. I mean, yep. disappointing. So not someone that's really going to be on your radar throughout the season. If you're feeling lucky, go ahead and stream. But apart from that, doesn't really have any fancy implications. Just has Bobby and Toby implications. And <laughs> just get your tickets for Dallas versus Philadelphia because that will be one of the longer hugs you'll ever see in NBA history. Yeah, it will likely be a uh, ESPN 30 for 30 someday, their, their reunion later on this year. But you're right, though. Uh, and then I'll actually get into introducing the, the show. The, the Boban thing... He's sort of like, uh, I don't want to call him a fantasy darling because I think we've done a pretty good job here at Hoop Ball of tempering people's expectations like you just did, which is, look, he's not going to be consistent. He can't, he can't stick around in the modern NBA for more than a couple minutes at a time. He's, he's a novelty. Uh, Doc was wise enough to play him just in those moments. It was always against the Nuggets, wasn't it? I, I mean, you watch all of those games. I feel like Boban got in there just to play the Denver Nuggets when he was a Clipper. It really was whenever they needed a burst. I mean, there were times when he wouldn't play entire games, and then there were times they were down by 15 or 18 points, and in the third quarter, he'd be like, all right, I'm just going to throw in Boban. And all of a sudden, the game swung. So he really is a momentum changer. It's weird to have those types of players in the NBA. I mean, you look at all different sports and I mean, soccer, you have a substitute that can come on in the 65th minute or something that's fresh and has total burst and will change the game a little bit. That doesn't really happen in many other sports. And so it's cool to see in the NBA, a guy like Boban can really change things. But apart from that, I mean, yeah, he was used a couple of times against random teams that he tried to mess up their tempo. Uh, he was fun to watch, though. Yeah, he is fun. He's uh, in, a, in a league of incredibly gigantic people he is that much bigger than all of the rest of them and it's i mean i hate to you know you talk about boban like this and i start to feel like i'm i'm doing uh a scene from this is the greatest show he's like the world's biggest man and he's just out there for us to look at but he's he's actually he's actually pretty good at basketball he's just too big and slow for the modern nba Oh, God, that's beautiful. I just saw that movie on the plane coming back from Italy. That is fantastic and a tremendous comparison. Yeah, he's just too slow for this NBA, but it, he's great to stand there and get offensive rebounds and dunk over <laughs> your head because his outstretched arms are so damn long. It is insane. But it's so insane. That, no, he's got nothing. It's so funny. If the rebound gets anywhere near him, he just reaches over people. It's like that. I mean, I'm reminded now of that scene in Spaceballs where he's, where Lone Star is holding Rick Moranis by his helmet and he's just swinging the, his Schwartz back and forth and he can't make contact. Uh, and that's Boban. But from the fantasy side, 
I really want to hammer the point that he's not a guy that's going to be unleash there's the, there's there's always this like release the bobon thing that comes out uh the big box sites i think maybe push it a little bit more than than we do and i think basketball monster does a pretty good job of keeping it sort of low key there uh he's not ever going to be this thing that we want him to be in the fantasy world which is a guy that can see 20 minutes a night he is as brandon just described uh, he's an energy changer when the situation warrants it, and I'm guessing Rick Carlisle understands that in Dallas. I think you'll see him used uh, pretty similarly to what we saw in uh, with the Clippers. Welcome to Fantasy NBA Today, by the way. Uh, Dan Bespris, Brandon Marcus, at BD Marcus, at Dan Bespris in that re- reverse order. If you thought that he was Dan Bespris and at Dan Bespris on Twitter, well, welcome to the show. So it's, it's good to have you. Um, Brandon, you and I... Uh, we're, we're pragmatic individuals. We don't draft our hometown teams, but I think people that have listened to us know you're a Clippers guy. I'm a Lakers guy. And right now, uh, I don't know about you, man, but I am, I'm good and puckered up here. <laughs> I'm like, I, this, this Kawhi weight is interminable. I, how are you getting through it? Because for me, it's usually like pop a Pepto and watch the Twitter stream go by. Yeah, I'm constantly looking at my phone because I've got alerts for Shams and Woj. So whenever they tweet, it's going to my phone. And every single one, I'm kind of hoping it's Kawhi. So this madness ends um, because I'm so tired of Twitter. It seems like my Twitter is Lakers Twitter now because of you and because of several other people that I follow. uh, Guys like Mark Stein. um, And we'll see several other L.A. obviously personalities that I follow that will throw some stuff in there. Um, yeah, it's, it's weird. I don't like it. Anybody that thinks they have any idea of what's going on right now and what teams are in or out, they're dead wrong. I I mean, that's what this is showing us because two days ago, that stupid tweet came out from that guy on Reddit and said that it was a done deal. If it was a done deal, we would have heard about it by now. And if they would have called the Clippers and said that they're out, there would not have been a meeting that night. So I just don't understand. I'm That's one thing with Twitter or it just has made this Kawhi thing a living nightmare for all of us. Uh, we're plane tracking now, by the way, as of this morning. No, we're not. Yeah, this is happening. Um, I believe Kawhi's representation, uh, I don't, what is the, the, what is the group? I can't think of the group now. Anyway, I guess their plane is landing in Toronto today. I don't know if that's for his meeting with the Raptors or if there's an announcement coming, but that's now doing a thing on Twitter. And uh, so everybody's reading into that. I, I don't... I don't know. I don't know, man. <laughs> this is all I got. Yeah. I mean, you wonder, because they they said all along that Toronto's going to get the last meeting, and they'll have a chance to give their pitch. And you wonder if by then, Kawhi's already decided, and he's going to tell them, you know what, I'm going either to the Lakers or the Clippers, or if he's going to hear them out, and he's going to go to Toronto all along. This whole plan was for him just to drag us along, knowing he's going to stay in Toronto and his last meeting was to say, hey, yeah, I'm coming back and let's run this back for whether it be a long term contract or like everyone's saying, a one and one. Uh, but, yeah, we have no idea, man. And I really want to know when this is going to come out. You would think it's going to be today, LeBron, right? Today. Huh? Does, does it doesn't have to be today. Does it? I don't know. I mean, it's either today or Friday. Do you think he would announce on July 4th? When did LeBron do it? July 2nd? Uh, yeah, well, it start. what was, it started, yes, last year was July 1st, the moratorium at 12.01 a.m., right? I yeah, think, part of me thinks he did it the 4th, but I could be wrong. I think it was sooner than that. I feel like it was yeah, in an Someone evening. just retweeted recently, LeBron James, I think it was Woj, that retweeted his, like, four-year 154, whatever it was. He goes, like, one year ago today. Yeah, so I, I think it was it yesterday or something or two days ago. Yeah, it was, like, early evening on the second day. So yeah. we're now into... Well, well, let's see. Sunday was day one, right? Today's Wednesday, so this is day four? So this is what this is showing you, by the way. What this is showing you is that Kawhi clearly did not do any tampering. Yeah, good for for Kawhi. He is the only NBA player in history to really wait until the deadline actually begins. And then, or whether free agency begins, rather, and then take it. Like he's supposed to, That's instead amazing. of having everybody sign at six o'clock Eastern time on and the first day, and we're all dying as a result of it. So I, I don't know which thing I want anymore. You know, I feels like if the stupid Charlotte Hornets could have actually had any cap space, they would have been a perfect marriage because all we ever hear is that Mitch Kupchak yeah. refuses to tamper. 
<laughs> I mean, your it's, reputation your reputation there, if Kawhi's like, I want the one guy who's not going to try to tamper, that would have been his guy. By the way, I, uh, I had one detail wrong. It's not Kawhi's plane that's on its way to Toronto. It's the owner of the Raptors who's on his way from L.A. to Toronto right now. So I, I assume that means that the meeting happened in L.A. already, and so now the Raptors' ownership is on its way back home for whatever reason we do not know. So plane watch is in full effect here on Wednesday, July 3rd. Uh, oh, it's so bad. So bad. By the way, this is crazy, but this brings up last season in fantasy soccer. And yes, that's a thing. Oh, my God. What have you done? There are people, there are people that are so dedicated that they like follow pictures from the training ground to see if the players are training. They'll, tr- they'll follow them all the way to the hotel, the players to the hotel, to see if a player's made it to the hotel. Because if they haven't made it to the hotel, then he's probably not going to play. It's crazy. And that's what this is becoming. <laughs> This is this is crazy. Uh, I can I can reply to you in saying that I have no idea what you're talking about on the soccer front. That, that's okay. Yeah, uh, I did watch like two thirds of the um, U.S. women's game yesterday. Match? Am I getting my lingo right? It's not a game, yeah, right? It's match. It's yeah, a match, match on the pitch. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I uh, I actually did I did play by play for one, and we're getting off topic here, but that's okay. I uh, d- I mean. Some like small town sports radio station offered me a soccer play-by-play gig, and I think it was like the NAIA championships. <laughs> but at the time, I was like, I don't know what the hell this is, and so I just did it. But luckily, my my uh, number two broadcaster at the time was a massive soccer fan, and so we just got in there, and I was like, you know, you're doing the lead on this, right? And he was like, yeah. Uh, and so then we just split the money, and and uh, I didn't look like a total idiot. I actually kind of tried to channel the. Uh, ESPN the Ocho with a few of my comments just to see if anybody was listening and um, uh, nobody. I want, nobody. I want that tape. Nobody. I really want that tape. <laughs> it was 2008 soccer. I think it was the NAIA soccer championships at Fresno Pacific or something like that. Anyway, um, back to the point here. The Kawhi Leonard thing. The fallout from this. Forget just the tracking of Kawhi Leonard. The fallout is is crazy because almost every other free agent is off the board now. If the Lakers don't get Kawhi, they almost have no choices left. There's just a handful of guys they could actually give legitimate cap space to. Uh, what, do the, what do the Clippers do if Kawhi doesn't sign? I mean, they're, they're probably targeting those same guys, right? Uh, I don't know what they're going to do. I, I really think that they're going to end up standing pat um, – Pat Beverly, that is. Hey, uh, we'll be talking about part. him later on. Yeah, I mean, I, there's no reason to give out that money um, to more than one-year contracts. And like you said, no one's really left. I'm not sure how much money they still need to spend to get to that. Um, oh, the floor. the floor, yeah. Because I know there's a certain amount you need to spend, and they have $32 million left, I believe. But if they sign a couple of those guys that they would need to get rid of if they sign Kawhi, I think they're going to be fine. I think all along the plan really is to make a play for next year if Kawhi does the 1-1 one one, just to go after him again. Uh, but this front office is so smart and savvy. I mean, the fact that they got Roddy Magruder last year at the end of the year, knowing full well he was not going to be able to be on that playoff roster so they could have their his bird rights so that they could sign him and go over the cap if they got Kawhi and they just signed him yesterday just shows you how smart and forward-thinking this front office is. And... It gives you an idea of how this team, sure, they may not get Kawhi, but they still know what they're doing, and that's important. Um, and then what about Toronto? I assume if he if he does not stay there, they that's sort of have the interesting a, thing. Yeah, that's the interesting thing. Do they start trading people? That that's the interesting thing. Knowing that they may not have a chance to do anything, do they rebuild? Knowing, like we have said numerous times that everybody's off the books next year. Do they go ahead and do they trade a Marcus Saul who has one year left on his deal? Do they go ahead do. and trade a guy like Ibaka? I mean, that's something that would be fun to watch. I think you do. What would you do there? I, I don't know. I, I really, if they think they have a legitimate shot to contend, which I don't think they do without Kawhi, but let's remember they won a bunch of games last year without Kawhi in their lineup. They're clearly a better team with him, no doubt about that, but maybe they think that they're still good enough where they could compete and get a top four or five seed in the uh, Eastern Conference. I, I blow it up, just for whatever yeah. that's worth. I think I, think uh, I probably would, too, to be honest with you. Every, but, with everybody coming off the books, I mean, that's 
That's a team that's on the wrong side of the, the age peak in the NBA. But do you do it now or do you wait till the trade deadline? That's the thing. That's a good question. Um, this is where I would trust in Masai better than, yeah. better, better than myself. Someone to go get the best deal out there. I'm, I would be tempted, okay, because I, I think you have to look at it from two different perspectives. How much general manager security do you have? Ujiri has a ton. So he can yeah. pretty much he can wait this thing out if he doesn't think he's getting the world's greatest deal. A lot of GMs, I think, would just grab whatever they could. And that's probably enough in a lot of cases to just go get some stuff since you can you can take this now to your fan base. And this is all, you know, if he stays, obviously they run it back. They try to win the championship. Uh, this is... It, I'm trying to think of the right way to to phrase this in terms of uh, what do they do if if Kawhi leaves without people listening to the podcast going, you guys are just assuming he's leaving. No, we're just we're playing a little game here where it's what do you do in both directions for all of these teams that have been, uh, I hate to say held hostage, but, you know, they've been just sort of watching things go by a little bit. Uh, I, I think you take anything you can and you can present it to your fan base as, Hey, look, we were going to have nobody on this roster next year. Now we've got nobody and we've got all these picks or young assets or whatever. It's a pretty easy winning situation that Toronto's put themselves in. I I love it. I love what they've done here. They've given themselves a very easy full stop in whatever they're doing. Either we run it back, we try to win one more time, and then we blow it up, or we just blow it up now. But either way, they're in a good spot. I mean, look at what they've done. They just won a championship, and they have a quicker path to rebuilding than the Charlotte Hornets, who've been horrendous for <laughs> their ex- well, the return to Charlotte since their return's existence, right? Like, well, well, that tells you what how important it is to have a competent front office. Yes, it is. Because if if you don't have a team that's not thinking ahead, then you're in trouble. And clearly, they didn't think ahead. I mean, how Charlotte didn't get either a commitment from Kemba or didn't trade him at the deadline is beyond me. I mean, if they they clearly had to have known that this was probably not going to happen. If they were not willing to give him that max contract, then they had to know he was going to leave. And maybe they bought the fact where he said maybe he doesn't need to take more money. But if I'm them, I'd trade him at the deadline. And they got too into the fact that Kemba was their guy, and they kept him, and they got nothing. Idiotic. I mean, it's it's. This is one of those ones where we could all see it so clearly from the outside, and that means it's real obvious because we're not that smart, you know. Yeah, and we know that their salary cap. It, it's been said numerous times that they couldn't sign anybody. No, they're a mess. They're and, beyond and, a mess. So they're not going to win, and there's no way Kemba was going to stay all along unless he truly loved Charlotte. The supermax was really, the only thing they had going for them with him, exactly. and then they didn't offer it. Exactly. Ugh. Anyway, this wasn't a bag on Charlotte thing. I was just thinking, like, look, the the Raptors figured out a way to build a winner and be ready for a rebuild at the same time. Uh, pivoting now away from Toronto and looping back to the Lakers, who we we kind of saved for the end here on this Kawhi discussion because they've been getting clobbered. Uh, just not clobbered necessarily in a negative sense. Just this is the team that everybody's talking about. This is the 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 power of the Lakers in the NBA world. Is there they end up as the focal point. Uh, I like what they've done so far to having, you know, and the Clippers, by the way. I feel like both LA teams have actually done some pretty good stuff considering the way that the last four days have played out. Clippers, knowing they're not going to get the second superstar, use that extra cap space to generate an extra first-round pick, got a couple of competent wings on their team. That's That's good. That helps you build for a potential future with or without one superstar on your team. And I like the Lakers getting a shooter in Troy Daniels and getting the premier veteran leader in the NBA in Jared Dudley. Uh, This is, to me, this is kind of the best they both could do at this point outside of maybe if you're the Lakers, you probably wanted like Jeff Green on a minimum as your third vet min guy right now. But I mean, in terms of two teams that are just sitting and waiting on one guy, I think they've done okay these last four days. Didn't you tweet? I agree with you, by the way. Didn't you tweet yesterday they only have six players right yeah, now? Yeah, six players. <laughs> That's so bad. Who are they going to sign? I, I also saw you retweet a list of all the remaining free agents, and I didn't actually go and look at that thread. Were they good or bad? They were not very good. Okay. Yeah. It, <laughs> so, yeah. It, 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 what do you do? I mean, if you're the Lakers and you don't get Kawhi, you have Anthony Davis, LeBron, Kuzma, and then really, who else? Who's going to play point guard? 
Uh, there is no point guard on this team. Oh, well, be, it would be Alex Caruso, which uh, should be... They're going to sign Rondo, aren't they? Is oh, he still available? Yes, I think they're going to sign Rondo. Please don't remind me of that. This is this is my nightmare. I, I figure the only way Rondo works on this team is uh, 15 to 18 minutes off the bench as a guy that feeds Anthony Davis, because that's what he did in New Orleans two years ago. Right. And that was functional. He was actually kind of helpful for that team in the role that they gave him because Drew Holiday could kind of protect him on the perimeter. AD could protect him behind it because he can't play defense anymore. Rondo's no longer has any lateral movement whatsoever. Um, There are a couple other decent backup point guard options out there. TJ McConnell, I think, would be really nice. Oh, he's a good player. I like him a lot. Um, But in terms of starting point guard, um, mm, nobody really. Uh, You know, you're looking at uh, maybe like a Devin Harris if you wanted to go veteran edition. Um, Quinn Cook. So what that became... tells you, by the way, what that tells you. I know you just said Quinn Cook too. That I mean, he's he can shoot threes and he's fine. He was okay with Golden State, but who knows how he's going to do it on other teams? Um, what that tells you is that we just started this whole conversation about drafting players from your favorite team. I really would go hard after LeBron and Davis, no matter what. I mean, the usage rate that those two are going to get is going to be through the damn roof. <laughs> yeah, these guys. Uh, you, don't, you don't think DJ McConnell is going to be orchestrating any offense? <laughs> when no, he signs the I don't think so. I mean, I really would be okay if you went 80 one one I, I really would, just based on the amount of usage he's going to get. It is going to be a lot. Well, what if Kawhi does sign with the Lakers, though? That changes things. Then it's, different, then it's a different story. I think yeah. all three are probably first-round picks. I mean, then you got to go back and you got to check the numbers of the Miami Heat when – Wade, Bosch, and LeBron were there to see how they finish fantasy wise. It was Bosch, by the way. Just as a just as a quick, I I remember it uh, clearly. It was one guy on in those big threes always ends up getting the short end. It was obviously Kevin Love in LeBron's second edition, and it was Bosch the first time around. He got turned into more of a uh, kind of a defensive specialist at times, and then he didn't. Um, LeBron maintained most of his. Wade had very small uh, dip, and then Bosch was the one who took the, the bigger hit. I don't know if well, that would be... Thing, same thing, by the way, went with Kevin Love, who also, yeah. by the way, is someone that the Clippers could trade for if they miss out on Kawhi. There's a lot of money left on that contract, though. Yeah, they'll, they'll t- I think they'll take that. Mm, man. Um, shooting guard is another position the Lakers would be looking for, and just at, while we're looking at that list... Uh, clutch client Kentavious Caldwell Pope is, is still out there. He's a oh God. It's uh, going to be LeBron and the band of misfits. Oh, David so Nwaba. They, actually, at shooting guard, there are some slightly better options for for cheap, cheap, cheap. Obviously, Danny Green's going to require a little more money. He's not a veteran minimum guy, but uh, you've got David Nwaba, Iman Shumpert, um, Kentavious Caldwell Pope, who we just mentioned a moment ago. Uh, so these are guys you could get probably near the vet men. I feel like KCP's got his bag. I don't know if he's looking for the big payday anymore. Uh, but this is this sadly is what's left. What I'm more concerned about, if I'm the Lakers front office, is if Kawhi does not sign, none of these guys are guys that you can put thirty two million dollars into. Like I don't Marcus Morris is a guy you they'd probably go get for like two years, sixteen million, something like that. Uh, I'm sure they'd make a run at Danny Green if he would consider going someplace without Kawhi. Uh, Boogie probably moves onto the list at a big man spot. I I mean, at that point, then you just start throwing money at people because there's no one left that deserves that much money. Yeah, if they miss out on Kawhi, I think there's a 95% chance he ends up in the Lakers, that being Boogie. Oh, yeah. I think the other guy the Lakers would probably shoot for in, in a situation where they don't get Kawhi is Kelly Oubre. Uh, I think he's a restricted free agent, but Phoenix has been spending a lot of money, and so maybe you throw a contract at him. He actually would be a decent fit. There, there are money. guys left. I mean, yeah. it just depends how you think they fit with their te- with your team and how much you're willing to overpay. Because there really are guys left, whether that be via trade or via free agency. Um, it just depends. Good point. And, and really, it's fascinating how one guy's holding everybody up, and you would hope that he makes the decision today – but the question is, I mean, how do the teams respond? I think that'll be the most interesting thing to watch is if he does go back to Toronto, how does the how do the Clippers front office and how do the Lakers front office, how do they respond to it? Mm. We shall see. I think it's happening today. I know I, I think you I know you said you think it's waiting a little bit longer. I think it's today. I could see it being tomorrow. Um, but I, I have a feeling that just based on this podcast, being the fact that you're a Lakers fan, I'm a Clippers fan that we're going to finish posting this at probably about 10.30 in the morning. 
he probably decides at about 12 o'clock. Yeah, yeah we'll, have to, we'll have to come back on and throw in a, a seven-minute uh, post-facto episode of the show at that point. Yeah, uh, I, I got until 3 o'clock, and then I'm leaving. But apart from that, it's, I, I'm good. I'm ready to go. So what uh, do you think you, about your other Clippers stuff? Uh, as, as, the, as our resident Clippers expert, you guys brought Pat Beverly back. That was a great one. Uh, Mo Harkless is a very good basketball player, and, and you guys just took him on to get a pick. You're like, here, you know, you can give us his salary. We got some room. You got to give us a pick, though. And then and McGruder. Uh, McGruder. Yeah. Um, I, I love the additions. I don't know. I mean, the Clippers are a very deep team right now, which confuses me a tad on the fantasy front. Well, they were last year, too, and it confused you. Remember, this is the same exact situation as last year, where the Clippers had so much that they decided to play everybody, and they went 10 deep. I mean, they were not afraid to bring everybody off the bench, and their bench mob played a large amount of minutes. I mean, so once you have that starting five, and then you bring in guys like Harkless, you bring in guys like Magruder to play along, the Lou Williams and the Montrez Harrell, I mean, you got yourself a good second unit, but that means that, When you're in fantasy land, which is what we talk about, none of these guys are going to be worth their value uh, for the most part. I mean, Gallinari is a guy that I'm going to stay away from because I just don't trust that he can make it through the entire season uh, once again. And (laughs) last year, we talked about it. I think he only played 65, 66 games last year. And we called it a massive success, which it was. Exactly, which is scary. And so you look at their starters, and you're probably only watching initially. You're watching Shea Gilgis Alexander to see how he starts. Because he's a guy that has a ton of potential. Yep. Um, and then, of course, you're drafting your Lou's and you're drafting your Montrez Harrells. And you're kind of watching, for the most part. I mean, Beverly's another guy that's going to give you minutes. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a lot of guys that are going to be on your wire and then be on your team. Guys like Zubak, um, off and on your team. This has been a rough offseason for the Dan Vespers old man squad so far. Yeah, no one's really landing in perfect places. No, some of them are landing in other countries. <laughs> I've got guys retiring. I don't know what the hell Darren Collison is up to now. He's like going to be banging on doors. I, I mean, this yeah, is like, what this is. oh, for heaven's sake, Nico's gone. I, I know he wasn't an old man squad guy, but he was a you know Dan Vesper's stocking squad guy. Uh, I think I'm still grabbing Pat Beverly late in my nine cat roto spots just because of his weird. I love his weird stat set. He does everything besides score. And it's just, he's like the perfect example of the guy that gets overlooked in fantasy because the only thing he doesn't do is the thing that people pay most attention to. He rebounds, he assists, he steals, he blocks. His turnovers are low. He's an okay foul shooter. His field goal percent is not good, but he only takes five or six shots a game, so it doesn't matter. Uh, He's going to end up on all of my teams. Let's be honest. You, you, uh, you love him. I you do. You should name your team something to do with Pat Beverly. It might be time. Or or you can just do something about Nico's gone. <laughs> All of my teams are just going to be a Photoshop picture of me crying as Nico walks away. I need, I need bye, to get to work bye, on Bye, Nico. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I, I, uh, I could change my... I, Almost all of my team names are uh, obscure old cartoon references. Like I have a, uh, well, not a, not well, they're not always cartoons. Some of them are just are like obscure '90s villains. Uh, Flintheart Glomgold, five points if you can name the cartoon that character was from. What? Flintheart Glomgold. That the Flintstones? That was the uh, the bad duck in Ducktales. Scrooge's Duck nemesis, tail. yeah. Oh Fl- Fl- he, he was, uh, I believe he was Irish and Scrooge was Scottish or flip flop, but I don't know. My accent's messed up there. Sorry, guys. Sorry to the listeners that are getting upset with that one. Um, yeah, so I may, I may have to get to work on a Photoshop here. Uh, do you think, I mean, I know, I know you like the Rodney Magruder thing, but does he play at all this year? Yeah, because they just play everybody. <laughs> yeah, they gave him three years, $15 million. They're not going to give him $5 million to sit on the bench and, and not play at all. Good I mean, boy. they really do play everybody, and they're happy playing everybody. And so you'll be able to play uh, Lou Williams, Magruder, Harkless, and uh, Trez bench. I mean, you'll be able to throw those guys out there. I mean, one of them might start uh, because if they don't get Kawhi, then who knows what happens. If Gallo gets hurt, Mo Harkless could actually be the Dan Vespers old man squad pickup of the year. Oh, yeah. There you go. 
So let's keep an eye. Harkless Watch 2000, uh, 1920 is in full effect. Don't don't I was worry. Burned by Harkless in the fantasy playoffs. I tried streaming him for a couple of games, and he shot like 0 for eight one game, um, and only got a couple of rebounds and didn't do any blocking of shots. And this came after like a week stretch where he was just tremendous. And then yeah. I grabbed him my game, and he sucked. That's the Mo Harkless way, man. As soon as you buy in, his knee starts to hurt, and then the whole thing comes goes to hell. So we'll see, though. I mean, again. Uh, he's he's behind somebody on the Clippers depth chart right now, so uh, that's where we're sitting on that one. And that is basically where we stand with Kawhi Leonard right now. We're we're just we're all in a holding pattern. All these front offices are waiting, bated breath. We wait. Everybody's getting their their uh, woge alerts, and uh, we'll see who gets it. I don't, man. I don't. I, I know everybody's making jokes about how Kawhi is going to announce. I, I would actually be kind of surprised if Woj or Shams breaks the news doesn't it feel like he's going to do it on like and i'm not going to make the i know everybody's like oh he's going to send a, a postcard to somebody or whatever uh i just feel like his group is going to put out the message not through probably. one of these people probably i mean does it come on his twitter account where he doesn't tweet or does he do it, <laughs> does he do it via instagram i mean that that'll be the interesting thing i mean does he just does he go on myspace and he release it there and see if somebody can find it that would be I mean, amazing. It's possible that his decision has been on myspace since <laughs> July 1st and nobody's been able to find it yet i mean we, we really don't know um here's a question for you and i'm curious sure. to get your take where's the best fantasy landing spot for Kawhi? uh probably the clippers yeah i think so too um and then how high would you draft him i don't know that i would really i think wherever he goes a lot of this meeting stuff has been about his can we Code please stop yeah can we come up with a new damn name for this please i beg of everyone gonna manage your load gotta manage his load gotta manage your load oh. load is such a weird word too it, yeah it's gross man Kawhi. i don't know if it needs to start with your camp or what but can we just call it like resting rest yeah resting <laughs> What we've yeah, been calling it, siesta. For, yeah, for what we've been calling it for the last fifty-five years, it's a rest. It's a rest day. We don't need resting a ma- period. Need a What's man his resting blood. period? When does he get a chance to get a chance to rest? Oh, give him a damn subscription to the Spice Channel if you want to learn how to freaking manage loads. I've I've had yeah. enough of this load management stuff. Uh, so that's my thing, though. I don't think he's playing more than six low sixties regular season games, no matter where he goes. So but I don't, when he plays, he's a top three fantasy asset. Yeah. So that puts him yeah, top 15-ish in a roto yeah. format. Head-to-head, I don't think you can draft him at all. Yeah, higher than he's going to go, most likely, is uh, where you want to take him, yeah. I guess. He's going to be great, um, but you gotta you got to pick your spots. Because remember, this last year, uh, right around the turn of the year, they put out a, the Raptors. I think put out a statement that was like, "Oh yeah, we're gonna we're gonna scale back his uh, his load management days. He's no longer gonna be sitting on back to backs." And then he just continued to sit on all of them. I mean, that was that was pure fluff. Nothing changed the second half of yeah. the season. It was exactly the same. Um, so yeah, I don't I don't think I'm drafting him. And what about Braun? Have we talked about him at all in all of this? I I feel like he's a lot of his pitch here is that he wants to dial it back a little bit too. He has to. He's he's already getting hurt. And the amount of minutes that he's played, we've talked about it. I mean, he's played probably at least four or five extra seasons just in the playoffs and the amount of minutes that he's played and how hard those minutes have played. I mean, he's, he's going to be wearing down soon. If you don't think that father time is going to catch up to LeBron, and even though he seems like the guy where father time would not catch up to him, you're wrong because it's going to happen in the next couple of years. And uh, he's a guy that it'll be interesting to see how he does fantasy wise. Cause that field goal percentage is going to start to dip at some point. Um, the turnovers perhaps maybe go up a little bit, but like you said, the minutes will probably go down at some point, but on the Lakers team that doesn't have anybody behind him, how many minutes can you actually dial him back? That's why he because needs Kawhi Vogel's so bad. Be, yeah, and Frank Vogel knows if he loses, he's out. So he's going to have to try and win. And uh, that is why this third superstar is such a huge deal. Because without him, and Anthony Davis, Marcus Morris, Alex Caruso, whatever I just described, is going to beat the bad teams, but not anybody that's average to better. And what happens if you have to play LeBron and Anthony Davis so many minutes because you don't get Kawhi, one of them gets hurt. Then what does that team turn into? Mm. It turns into the 30-win team from a couple of years ago. I hope Anthony Davis uh, sees a doctor about his uh, lower, his gastrointestinal problems. <laughs> <laughs> Can you please go to games and yell, 
Anthony Davis, do you have to poop? <laughs> yeah, that's do what I'm doing the first management day. too. We're working on getting media passes here, and as soon as I get into press row, that's what I'm. <laughs> that's what I'm doing. I'm. I'm gonna have a rolled up piece of cardboard in my pocket that I can turn into a little megaphone, a makeshift megaphone, and just yell, "Here's a modium. It works. Yeah. It works." It's, his load management could be for when he has to drop <laughs> that's a load. That's that's a his load management. Yeah, we got all sorts of load loads to manage on today's podcast. Um, I think that's about it for the Kawhi stuff. I did want to bug you. I know we've sort of had a couple days now. You were part of our wonderful live show on Sunday, which, by the way, I still think had the the finest closing of any podcast I've ever done. The uh, the chance in unison. Um, now that you've had a, a couple of days to let things kind of melt on your brain. Did you come up with anybody that, that I don't want to call them necessarily under the radar, but who are some of the winners in all of this? There are several winners. Um, I think Steph is a big winner with KD leaving. Mm. Um, I think Steph could easily make a case to go in the top two or three next year. It'll be interesting to see how many minutes he plays, but without Clay to start the season. Um, I secretly like Isaiah Thomas. Is that weird? That- <laughs> no, no. I was trying to play devil's advocate with Neil on yesterday's show. Yeah, I mean, I really do like that he's going to be... I mean, Ish Smith is not stopping him from starting. I mean, that that is seriously going to happen. And this guy has shown that when he has a chip on his shoulder, he could be a very good player. And he was not given that chance in Denver because he had some very good guards ahead of him. But Isaiah Thomas could be someone that you grab late in drafts and ends up performing top 75. I mean, it's possible. It really is possible. That doesn't happen for very many players, but, but he's a guy. Um... Can I let me throw one thing in on the Isaiah Thomas front? You know what I would do there, and I, I tried to convince Neil of this, but he wasn't having it. Uh, and it's against most of my strategy to draft someone that you know is going to hurt you in field goal percent. Uh, I think, like you said, you draft him late, and I think you start him on your bench to begin the year and just see how it goes before you just throw him in there. At like, here you go, Isaiah. Here's a starting spot on my roto team. I don't think I'd use up my games cap on him the first what, week or two of the season. But if it looks like it's going well, then you move him in. And if it's a disaster, you know, you probably got him in the 12th, 13th round anyway. So it's not going to hurt you much. So I think that might be a nice kind of middle ground way to play that one because you are chasing upside at the end of draft day. Uh, continue. Sorry, I jumped in. No, you're spot on. I mean, I mean, that's exactly what I was trying to say is that like, first of all, I don't play the game cap thing. So that's that different for me. But if I was, that's exactly what I would do. I would see how he starts. Um, and then go from there. I mean, if you see in the first week or two that he's a guy that's going to play a lot of minutes, he's going to produce, he's going to be someone that you can count on, then yeah, fire him up and see how he goes. I mean, uh, apart from that, I mean, uh, I, I like Julius Randle. Randle's a really good guy to grab. It, it's New York sucks. Um, yes, there's no do. one else really that offensively is going to do much there. Um, Whiteside's gone. So uh, I know everybody liked uh, Adebayo, especially our friend Mike Apatria was trying to fire him up. Yeah, he's um, good. he's time. my buzz guy of the year so far. I, I think he's going to get. I, I would love to have him on all of my fantasy teams, but I think he's going to get drafted way early. the The hype trains already got some coal thrown into the engine, and just wait until freaking August, September. There is going to be so much bam chatter, and probably rightfully so. Uh, but he may end up getting scooped too early. Yeah, that that's what I'm. I'll be curious about is to see if the fantasy experts and some of the big box spot sites, um, how high they rate him. Hopefully they don't, but <laughs> I, I, I have a bad feeling they're going to. Um, but that's a guy that if you're an auction league, spend 20 bucks on him. Like he, he at least 20, he's, he's going to produce, he's going to get the minutes. They show and they like him. They played him over Whiteside last year and he produced, um, you want guys, that you know, for sure are going to start and for sure are going to help you. And you don't get many bigs that put up big assist numbers, and Anabayo does that. Uh, Neil tried to convince me to draft Kelly Olynyk, and I told him I wasn't going to do it because uh, because Myers Leonard is actually going to play backup center minutes. Am I right, or is Neil right there? Is, what team is Kelly Olynyk on? He's still on the Heat because originally he was going to go to the Mavs as part of the Jimmy Butler thing, and then that got scrapped because the okay. Heat didn't realize the Mavs wanted Derek Jones Jr. So he's I don't still in Miami. With Linick. He showed last year that he's unreliable. If James Johnson goes down, I'll take all the Kelly Olynyks. But until that day, I'm not touching him. How many times last year did you try recommending Olynyk and then he let you down? Every time that James Johnson came back. <laughs> that was what I thought for sure. 
I was watching, I was like, okay, this has got to be the time that they're like, okay, James Johnson is just kind of getting old. Like, he, his prime was extremely short-lived. By the time he figured out his game, he started to get aged, and he had the, the sports hernia, and that knocked him out for a while. And Olytic was putting up these big numbers when he was down, and then Johnson came back and it was like, oh, he's playing 25 minutes again. What is this god-awful place? I mean, you know I put Miami on uh, no heat allowed for a little bit because they just took every position on the floor and split it 24-24 between two different guys. Yeah, exactly. Except Josh I, I would monitor the preseason for some of these guys. I mean, I think one of the most important players to monitoring the preseason is going to be Thomas Bryant. I talked oh, to Matt yeah. about his depth, um, or length rather, during our live show that I really did not trust Scotty Brooks. Um, if you see he's getting 28 to 32 minutes, uh, I'm fine with that. I'm fine drafting Thomas Bryant. There are going to be some good bigs that go late. I think that's one thing that we're realizing is you. Uh, I know everybody hates Whiteside, but Whiteside could be someone that helps you out in Portland. Um, he's going to be coached by a pretty good coach um, and Terry Stotts. So Whiteside's an option. Guys, like we've said, Julius Randle, Adebayo, and then maybe perhaps guys like Mitchell Robinson that are already in place. And then, of course, you have someone perhaps like Derek Favors, over in New Orleans, that could be of some value there. So th- there are bigs that are going to be good that you can draft later. Yep, and I love the way New Orleans plays, too, just on the Derek Favors front. They don't uh, they don't slow down for nothing, and you can just pile up fantasy stats out there. You're absolutely right. There are some very clear uh, big men choices. Um, absolutely go bananas with Thomas Bryant if it looks like he's going to get starters minutes, too. And I feel like they kind of want to because they gave him a little bit of cash. Um they- they Sorry, gave John Wall a lot of cash, too. Yeah, well, they were going to play him, and then he exploded. <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah. By the way, did you see these rumors that there's a way that uh, I think Miami's trying to get Bradley Beal, and the only reason that the only way they could do that, um, it, the only way Washington would do that is if they take John Wall's contract, Oof. too. Oof. How in the like, world? What could my. Well, I mean, how, how does that happen? How, how do you make that work financially? I did not see that, but now I've got to look up the Miami Heat contract situation while we're finishing up the show and try go to figure out. Go ahead and Google it. We'll, we'll go right now. Okay. Go ahead and just Google Bradley Beal Miami and then type in John Wall too because I want to see what popped up because my buddy alerted this to me where he said in our group chat, he's like, hey, so Bradley Beal apparently could uh, go to Miami. And I was thinking to myself, how the hell is that possible? And then I Googled it and it said something about maybe them taking John Wall's contract too. And that some teams, or if Bradley Beal does go, that Washington's going to try and put them, whoever takes Bradley Beal with John Wall's contract. I mean, how is that going to work, and why the hell would anybody do that? I like Bradley Beal a lot. He is going to be a first-rounder next year if he's the only guy there in Washington. But I don't love him enough in real-life basketball to take on John Wall's contract. Too. Yeah, it, it completely kills your team. I mean, there's about $67 million, I believe. Uh, between the two of them together so if you're Miami you could potentially I think guarantee Ryan Anderson's contract uh Goran Dragic Ryan Anderson together gets you know John Wall's contract by itself <laughs> uh, so bad James Johnson and Kelly Olynyk together get you around Bradley Beal so you could unload but I mean oh boy uh James Johnson has a player option for the following year so does Kelly Olynyk. I don't know that if I'm Washington that's what I would want to get back, but it would certainly clear things up because Ryan Anderson could be bought out. His contract is not fully guaranteed. Goran Dragic, uh, you could either play him or trade him. So it would get like half of John Wall's contract off of the books there, but that would be, I mean, then Miami has no roster. And we... Exactly. And they're going to get whoever the Lakers don't get in this veteran I was going to say, they're, they're just Lakers eat. <laughs> At that point. Although it would be funny, all these teams charging hard to see who can sign Trey Burke to a $2 million contract. Oh, my God. That's the world we live in, and here we are. Uh, We're waiting for you, Kawhi. We're waiting for you. <laughs> yes, please, Kawhi. Let's get this thing done now. I think my, I think my uh, abdomen has, has had enough fun for the week. Um, that's it, folks. Fantasy NBA Today. We'll put a pin in this one. Brandon Marcus at BD Marcus on Twitter. I am at Dan Vesperus. This was presented by Hawaiian Isles Kona Coffee, as is all of our free agency coverage here at Hoopball, including Aaron Bruski's article handing out grades and analysis on every single signing, and there are about 200 of them by the end of all of this nonsense uh, coming up over the next week or two. Uh, tomorrow, Neil Rochelani. I don't know who the hell he's talking to. 
It'll be Neil and somebody. They'll be breaking down more free agency stuff. Adrian and Coach on Friday. Adrian's got his computer in the shop right now, so we're trying to get that mic issue sorted out. Hopefully that will be done uh, by Friday, and hopefully we'll have some news by then. Happy 4th of July, everybody. Since I'm not going to be with you tomorrow, we'll talk to you soon. This has been a Hoop Bowl presentation.